So I would like to say a warm welcome to all of you. I can't see you, but um, um, I hope you have a good conference. I would like to talk today about how neurobiology can help to improve psychotherapy in borderline personality disorder. So actually, rather than going through a lot of uh, detailed findings, I would rather focus on the interaction of neurobiology and psychotherapy and show them what can be done and, and how neurobiology can use improve psychotherapy. So as you all know, there are CPD has many facets, and in the center of borderline personality, of course, uh, stands emotion dysregulation. And um, this is also, of course, in the focus of neurobiological research, which, as you all know, is closely related to self-injurious behavior, um, impulsive and aggressive behavior, and to problems in social interaction. And I will talk about these facets in the next 45 minutes and go through all of these and show you some recent findings here. Let's start with uh, emotion dysregulation. So from a brain perspective, um, the amygdala is in the center of attention here. Um, there are a lot of findings that show that the amygdala is overactive. As you can see here, the amygdala with its gray bars in EPD as compared to healthy controls in white bars. Not only with negative pictures, but also with neutral pictures. There are a lot of findings like that. We have done a meta-analysis. Uh, this is a robust finding. So it's not new, but what is more interesting actually is what does the brain when you are instructed to um, regulate emotions, such as here in this emotion regulation paradigm where you are shown these pictures and then you are instructed to reduce your emotions. What happens in the brain there, and um, people like Harold Königsberg and um, our group have done studies in that, and we um, have uh, found that in these studies, in these three brain studies, um, emotion regulation is disturbed. Regions such as the insula or the amygdala are overactive here in borderline personality disorder, whereas regions that control emotion, such as the orbital front cortex, are not as active as it should be, as you can see here. So, we can say that all our patients display an increased amygdala activation and also disturb prefrontal limbic connectivity patterns. This is just to illustrate that where that all takes place. Here is the amygdala on the right side, uh, the red dot, the amygdala, which is regulated by two pathways, actually both stemming from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, one through the cingulate cortex here in green, uh, and the, the more ventral pathway through the orbital front cortex, regulating the amygdala. In this mechanism, we found that not only um, the um, amygdala has not only an enhanced activation of borderline personality disorder, but in general has a smaller volume. So there is a severe disturbance of the amygdala in these prefrontal regulating pathway. So there is a disturbance during cognitive um, regulation of emotions such as reappraisal. But as you all know, there's another me me mechanism of emotion regulation, namely self-injurious behavior. And we have spent uh, a couple of years now to, to better characterize the mechanism behind self-injurious behavior and how this is related to emotion dysregulation. And I'll show you that in the next couple of slides. We have studied pain processing in borderline personality disorder with devices such as this uh, thermos, each element that is uh, placed at the back of the hand. We found that uh, pain sensitivity is severely reduced. You can see the red line here that the borderline patients show a marked shift of the pain sensitivity towards lower pain ratings. Um, and in the, uh, in the bottom of this slide, you can see the brain activi activation pattern during pain stimulation. When we give these pain stimuli, um, regions such as the amygdala or the anterior cingulate cortex are deactivated, which is the opposite of the normal pattern. Normally, with pain, 
the amygdala is activated. So interestingly here in borderline patients, it's the other way around. And this was one of the first hints that there was should be something behind the self injury uh, behavior that leads to a dampening of affective arousal and amygdala activity. We have combined these um, methods then in this study here, we did together with uh, Sabina Herbert um, in this study where we first showed the pictures for a few seconds and then afterwards added uh, pain stimuli and what we found again in the beginning here in the, uh, in the initial phase is you can see the higher values of amygdala activation as in previous studies overactive amygdala but as you can see here with pain in the regulation phase the amygdala activation goes down to normal levels so another hint as this um, effect regulation mechanism through painful stimuli here. We went one step further to in, in this line of uh, investigation to, uh, to, um, to uh, look at the mechanism behind self-injury. We looked at tissue damage. A tissue injury, as you all know, most types of self-injurious behavior are related to tissue injury, such as uh, with the incision paradigm that we use uh, in conjunction with stress. So we first stress participants here in with such a mental arithmetic under time pressure. You can see in the upper left here, this is the Montreal imaging stress task. You have to do uh, mental arithmetic in your head and you are told, always told that you are too slow. You are told that the other participants are in the green range but you are held by the algorithm in the red range. So you never make it to the green range. It's really stressful as you can see here. Um, the four line patients with solid lines as well as the healthy controls, the dotted lines show a stress increase after the uh, Montreal test. But when we afterwards apply this incision, so it's a small, uh, it's a small um, incision in the forearm, it's the, um, the size of a many puncture um, it, and it's uh, um, leading to a stress reduction for all patients with a further stress increase in health control. So again, a, uh, an opposite mechanism here. And on the level of the amygdala, when we do that in the scanner, uh, we found that incision leads again here, the, the, um, the red bars, we see that incision here on the, the right leads to a, <coughs> again, to an increase of amygdala activity, while it leads to an increase of amygdala activity in healthy control. So we were then interested in um, understanding is it really the tissue damage or is it the pain per se? So how did we test that? We compared a, uh, a, an incision used with a calpel here uh, with another pain stimulus, which is the so-called blade. It's a blade stimulus. It's placed at, at, the, at the arm. It does not penetrate the skin. It's just as painful as the scalpel. And, um, but it, the only difference is that the scalpel, of course, penetrates the skin, whereas the blade does not. And we have a com control stimulus where we just touch the arm to the blunt end of the scalpel. Uh, with a, uh, in the control condition, there is no change of, uh, of uh, stress levels. But with the other two stimuli, with the scalpel as well as with the blade, there is a decrease again of uh, Stress levels, and interestingly, there's no difference between the incision and the blade stimulus. So, in, in contrary to our expectation, there was no difference between these stimuli. So, it's independent of the skin penetration. Both pain stimuli lead to a decrease of um, stress levels in borderline personality disorder. Last step of this line of research is the role of seeing blood. Um, probably, you all know that patients. We often report that the important stimulus is uh, the pain blood, seeing blood flowing over the arm. So what did we do to test that? We combined this blade stimulus now um, with an, uh, an application of artificial blood, so this is, uh, which is used in the movie, for example. It's the same temperature, the same consistency, the same color as real blood, and um, we combine that, and as you can see here in this bar graph, four line patients here on the left, if we combine
times the pain stimulus with blood, we show this stronger decrease of um, stress levels as compared to non-blood. So also the pain level was the same. Uh, blood led to a further decrease of um, stress levels here again. And interestingly, most, most participants um, uh, reported that although they knew it was clear the blood, um, because we told them beforehand, it felt really like it's real blood, also in healthy control. So, okay, so now coming to the connection to psychotherapy. So we understood a bit better what is behind self-injury, behind emotion regulation. How can, can that uh, knowledge now help us to improve psychotherapy? And I want to show you two lines of research here. Uh, first, we monitor the regular CBG trials we are doing uh, neurobiologically, and that's one line, and the other, oops, the other line is that we develop new treatments such as real-time fMRI neurofeedback training, which I will show you in a minute. First, talking about CBT treatment, uh, um, and I don't have to tell you that CBT is a well-established and well-investigated therapy. There are a lot of trials, there's a meta-analysis, a Cochrane review, is good evidence for DBT, has large effect sizes, um, but we have a lot of problems, as you all know, and I don't want to go into details. We only have 50% respondents in all types of treatments for BBD. We have a lot of disturbing factors such as dissociation, PTSD, and etc. So we need more and better treatments, of course. But let me first show you how we use neurobiology to better uh, monitor DBT. Uh, <coughs> Um, we did that um, in our 12-week inpatient DBT um, that we are conducting here in Germany. And we had uh, three groups. We had a DBT group of 37 patients that were measured before and after inpatient DBT. We had a treatment as usual group. Um, they were 15 patients, um, not in treatment, but um, measured twice with a 12-week between and a healthy control group of 29. We assess um, several mechanisms of um, emotion regulation. I will focus on the left two. So um, first on reappraisal, that's the same uh, I showed uh, in the beginning of my presentation. Pictures are presented, and you are prompted either to reduce uh, the upcoming emotion or just to passively view the picture. Okay? So we assess the effect of reappraisal. Again, a study we did together with uh, Sabine uh, Happers uh, in Heidelberg in a two-center um, trial. So first, uh, the um, data for the real races. Overall, there was an amygdala activation, not surprisingly, but uh, we separated responders, or like DBT responders from non-responders, and the left is uh, the responders, and red is the real race condition, and black is the look condition. Uh, it is Look at the respondents. You can see that during rebreath, there's a marked decrease from before to after CBT, while the non-respondents there's basically no change. So rebreath works as after a successful um, a DBT. Um, it leads to a severe reduction of amygdala activity, but not in non-respondents. So here you can really monitor the effect on the amygdala level. So coming to the second mechanism, this is the mechanism behind self-injury, cellular stimulation. We show pictures, and as you remember, combine pictures with heat pain. A negative and neutral pictures are combined with heat pain. Uh, what did we find here? First, we looked at pain sensitivity, so um, before CBT and after CBT, which is, of course, the reduced pain sensitivity, as you remember. Uh, but this tends to normalize after DBT. Um, there's a, tends, a trend, a specific trend for normalization of pain sensitivity after DBT. And um, you remember that the, in borderline patients, the amygdala is deactivated through pain. You see here before um, DBT is the finding of deactivated amygdala after DBT when we combine negative pictures with pain, we find the, say, the normal pattern, the activation of the amygdala. That's what you want to see, that you see in healthy 
Um, and this is uh, nice to find that um, after a successful DBT, this mechanism tends to turn around in, in the direction of normal um, activation through pain. We not only look at, uh, at activation patterns, we also look at um, volume changes. There's a new line of research looking at volume, the very short-term volume changes uh, in the brain. And here we look at the three-month effect of CPT on volume. And on the whole brain level, we found a uh, um, strong decrease uh, um, in, uh, in this volume in treatment of the Here in the anterior cingulate cortex, in the prefrontal cortex, but an increase in the CPT group. So this is a, uh, the opposite pattern in the CPT group. This region increases in volume while in the power group, the treatment the user group, it decreases. And finally, we look at predictors. So we do all the uh, functional and structural data in a mixed model of uh, looking at predictors. Um, we looked at uh, CD means clinical data, we looked at um, structural MRI, functional MRI, fMRI, and the combination. And um, interestingly, to our surprise, it's the strongest predictor for uh, treatment success was volume, was the volume of the amygdala and the hippocampus here in the red. Uh, it, it was a better predictor <coughs> actually than the clinical data, and also better than the data. Um, so the volume of amygdala and hippocampus, uh, the bigger the volume, the better the, uh, the treatment success, the DBT success is in um, our study here. Okay, so now the second line of research, developing new therapies for emotional dysregulation. What we do is called real-time fMRI neurofeedback um, because it's now possible to analyze the data of very quickly, within a few seconds, you subject line the scanner, uh, watch these pictures again, and see a bar graph, um, here, sorry, uh, see a bar graph at, the, at both sides of um, the picture, which is um, a measure of the amygdala activation. And the instruction is to down, you get this bar graph down by whatever means they, they like to do, to do it. We don't give instructions how they regulate the emotion, the instruction is just to get the bar bars down, um, and we do that um, with over uh, four days. So we did four days of uh, training in, in borderline patients, four days, um, 30 minutes, um, and there are three conditions. So either regulating the amygdala, just viewing these uh, pictures, or viewing neutral pictures, or three conditions. But our main um, interest was to look at the regulated condition, so uh, down-regulating the bar graph while looking at these pictures here. So the first pilot study, um, we looked at amygdala down-regulation uh, in 10 borderline patients. You see here there's a difference between the regulated and the few conditions. The amygdala is less active in the regulated condition. Um, as compared to the blue condition, so down regulation works. And uh, we had some initial results regarding psychopathology, um, dissociation went down, and also emotion awareness improved uh, in the course of these four sessions of real time fMRI. But what is even more important than looking at just uh, simply the amygdala is looking at the connectivity of the amygdala with other um, with regulating regions such as the BMPFC, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. When we instruct the patient to downregulate, um, here first we looked at healthy in a, in a pilot study in healthy. We see that if, um, neurofeedback leads to an improvement of this connection here uh, between these two regions. Um, and the better the connection is, the less activation is in the amygdala. So there's a negative uh, correlation between the connectivity strength and the amygdala activity. So um, this, this, the improvement of the connectivity strength leads to an amygdala downregulation here. So now we did that in health and in borderline patients. And uh, what we found is that uh, when we did four sessions of uh, neurofeedback, 
in the second session already we showed an uh, improvement of this connectivity strength to levels which are found in, in healthy. So already in the second section we found an improvement of this connectivity strength. Now um, we just completed a larger study where we looked at much more parameters that can be changed through this real-time fMRI neurofeedback. Um, we looked not only uh, um, on the amygdala and the connectivity, but also looked at transfer effects. So we looked at other emotion regulation paradigms, such, such as the emotional working memory tasks, but uh, we looked at for the questionnaire scores, like the borderline symptom list or the Zanarini scale, and we looked at the transfer into everyday life with this ambulatory assessment, looking at emotion and emotion regulation uh, during everyday life, and we did three sessions of neural feedback here, in here, and one, two, and three, and tested then uh, transfer effects and questionnaires, and also follow-up six weeks later, six weeks after the last neural feedback session. Let me show, just show you a few examples of our findings. Um, first, the Sanarini um, borderline symptom scale. Um, we found a significant decrease of Sanarini score, scale scores uh, for, the, for the overall score, but also for the effective uh, score and for the impulsivity. Uh, not, uh, uh, sorry, not for the impulsivity, but for the uh, for social interaction. Um, and that is what's important is that um, here these patients were not in any other uh, psychotherapy. So they only did this uh, neurofeedback over two weeks, and this already led to a decrease of uh, the borderline symptomatology. As I said, we also looked at transfer effects into everyday life. We looked at uh, effective instability, and this improve for positive effects, negative effects, and also for the for tension levels, um, we found a decrease of fluctuation of tension, so the emotional instability went down um, um, after neurofeedback. And finally, we looked at um, emotion regulation, emotion modulated startle. As you probably know, the startle uh, reflex is um, process through the amygdala, so it's a measure of amygdala activation, and um, we tested the startle reflex in combination with, again, with uh, effective pictures, so pictures plus startle probe. Uh, before, uh, before treatment, uh, there was even an increase of uh, startle uh, activity in the regulating condition, so it seems that the patients were scared when they were instructed to uh, to regulate and showed even an increase of startle in the regulating condition. After after these three sessions of feedback, it was the opposite. So they showed the effect of decreased uh, startle uh, in the regulating condition. So um, there was a significant interaction. So we to sum that up. We developed the real-time fMRI neural feedback training. Uh, we tested that in, in, in health healthy sample, the healthy foot uh, able to downregulate the amygdala in training and in a transfer run. We implemented this training in a borderline sample in now in two pilot studies and could demonstrate that the borderline patients successfully downregulate the amygdala and also increase amygdala prefrontal connectivity uh, to normal levels. And so we concluded that real-time FMI may be used to increase efficacy and also time success of psychotherapy. And so the next step is to do a control trial with neurofeedback, and we will um, do that in a multi-center trial in Germany uh, soon. So now, shifting gears and coming to impulsivity and aggression, what, uh, what are the um, new findings here? Um, as you know, impulsivity is a very complex and multi-dimensional construct um, it has many facets, most importantly reaction inhibition, delay of gratification, and impulsive aggression. In EPTE, there is an interesting discrepancy. So if you ask the patients, they always report that they are impulsive. But if you do behavioral tests, you uh, rarely find uh, um, 
higher impulsiveness cause, and so the question is, why is that? Which might have to do with emotional uh, arousal or stress levels, so that um, impulsivity might be related to, uh, to stress levels, and it might be related to the comorbidity of borderline and ADHD, which are both um, characterized by impulsivity and affective lability. So we investigated that in a couple of studies. First, uh, on a psychometric level, we could show that um, with this uh, state impulsiveness score, there is an effect of stress, as you can see here in these middle two columns. We tested borderline patients, we tested a mixed group of borderline plus ADHD, and a, and a pure ADHD group on the right. So the effect of stress for the increase of uh, impulsivity was only found in these two borderline groups, the pure and the mixed group. The ADHD group were already very impulsive on the baseline with no further increase. Um, so there is an effect of ADHD with the baseline effect and a further stress effect in borderline. Similar finding on the, uh, on the anger levels or the state of, uh, anger expression cause um, also an increase with other uh, here we um, experimentally induced stress again. So it's a similar task as I showed you before. And uh, only in the BPD group we find an increase of, uh, of anger levels under stress. Uh, already elevated baseline levels of anger as compared to ADHD and healthy, and no change in the ADHD group under stress. Now coming to the experimental findings, um, in, in this go stop part, uh, there is this um, go stop trial. Uh, you should not react if the color changes, so the, Normally, there's a no-stop um, if the, the numbers stay the same, but if the color changes, you have to stop. So this is a reaction inefficient task. So the number of inefficients was dependent on stress again in the borderline group. Um, here, an increase of pale inefficient um, in borderline, but not in healthy. And here, we com control for ADHD symptoms. Um, and no difference under resting condition, no specific no significant difference under resting condition, but a difference under stress condition. And finally, in this domain, we looked uh, at neurochemistry. We looked at sudamate and GABA levels in MR spectroscopy, here again in the singular. What we found is um, a correlation of impulsivity and sudamate levels. So the more clodamate, uh, the higher the impulsivity. And the opposite was the case for, uh, for GABA, for the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA and the aggression in the, um, uh, the inferior single cortex. Yes. So this might op also open uh, new avenues for, uh, for drug development in this domain. So the final uh, chapter of my presentation is on um, social interaction and social cognition. And here I uh, have to uh, give you a little bit of a theoretical background, and I use uh, here this uh, social information processing model, which nicely explains uh, social information processing from the sensory input uh, all the way down to behavior. So, uh, of course, as all behavior, it starts with perception, so we perceive a social stimulus, we interpret a stimulus, then we match this stimulus with our individual goals, then we make a plan for behavior, we anticipate consequences, then we show a certain behavior, and we evaluate the behavior. Very generic model for social information processing, and of course here we have two important uh, factors uh, that influence this processing: is our database of schemas and rules and so on. And of course, and particularly important for DPD, uh, it is closely related at all steps of this chain uh, with emotion process. And I will show you uh, two examples, uh, only two examples, where. Um, uh, emotion processing comes into play here. Let's first talk about uh, the, the beginning of this um, of this change. 
the perception and the interpretation of uh, social stimuli in CPT. And um, for this, we use the so called thin slices paradigm. Uh, what does it mean? Thin slices means a short video sequence um, of a target person. You do uh, this video and you judge this target personality only by only not knowing this person, but just viewing this video. That's been used in a couple of studies, and there is also uh, some evidence from borderline samples, uh, not from the thin slices paradigm, but from other paradigms. Or from, from questionnaires and clinical knowledge, that borderline patients ability to evaluate other persons more negatively than as the controls, um, and that borderline patients judge other persons as less, less trustworthy. And yeah, looking at the other uh, way around, uh, there is evidence that borderline individuals are evaluated negatively in the clinical context. Uh, they uh, are assessed as less likable. They, it is assumed that they show greater stability of symptoms. Uh, they are seen as manipulative, attention-seeking, and treatment-resistant. Um, uh, they may, are made responsible for their symptoms. And clinicians rate uh, patients' descriptions more negatively when they are labeled as online patients. So there is quite some evidence for a negative evaluation uh, by only by in short sequence or only by labeling uh, someone as a CPT. So the question now is, um, does this labeling persist when we take away the label, CPT? How did we do that? Uh, we did the thin slices paradigm um, and it did that in a sample of target participants. And these target participants are the ones that are shown in, in, uh, in videos. Um, the targets introduced themselves and were filmed without saying something about their diagnosis. We, we filmed 26 CPD patients, 14 females, 12 males, age was mean uh, around 30, uh, 26 healthy controls, same uh, distribution of gender, um, uh, same age range, and no difference in years of education. And these target um, participants did uh, a, a dictator game. You probably know that the dictator game is very simple. Uh, you get five euro, oops, five euro, and uh, in an envelope, and you can take out as much as you want, and the recipient gets the rest. That's the dictator game. Um, and uh, we did that here with, with these uh, fifth, and nothing is given back. It's only a one-shot uh, uh, social interaction game, just to see how much you take out. Yeah, you can take out whatever you want. You don't get a feedback. No. Uh, well, so in our uh, sample, the borderline patients and the healthy controls uh, shared the average same amount of money, a um, bit more than half. No difference between the money uh, amount of money shared. Um, and now, we, this was the um, that was done in, 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 the, in the target participants that are shown in the video. Now we have the radar, no? or it's the uh, student sample that watched this video. The student sample of 92 um, healthy females, um, age 18 to 62, uh, mean age 24. And they also 20 randomly selected out of the 52 uh, target uh, participant videos. Um, so it's a video, 60 second video, they all talked about their uh, very generic, generic things, about their hobbies. Um, and uh, about where they like to go for holidays, for example, nothing about uh, disease or uh, health or so. Um, then, after watching this video, they were rated as uh, regarding trustworthiness, sympathy, and they, uh, the students were asked how much money did they share. So they were asked about the cicada game. So, the results for the judgment of the target person. As you can see here, Borderline patients were rated as less trustworthy without knowledge of the diagnosis and were rated as less sympathetic, significantly. And uh, there was a related uh, regarding the amount of money shared, there was no significant difference, but uh, there was specifically uh, the amount was smaller for the PPD subjects. 
with a relatively low effect size. Okay, so the second um, line of research I want to show you is, is a little bit more down the road of this um, uh, social information processing, looking at the behavior of the state. What we did here in Mannheim in the context of our clinical research unit is um, a virtual reality interaction game. It's called the Mannheim Group Rejection Paradigm. Um, so you are placed in a virtual chat room with other um, with these avatars you uh, meet with um, or you are subjected uh, to meet with uh, six um, other people around your age that have names and uh, you here you chat about um, your again about your hobbies about the things you like with food preferences etc more or less small talk situation here with these other people then you can raise the, the other people with these smileys here. After this group interaction, the virtual reality group interaction, um, we have two uh, conditions. We have an inclusion condition. Uh, you are told that, uh, for example, that five out of these other six persons you met like you, would like to get a, together with you, would have a coffee with you. Uh, that's the inclusion condition, so five out of six. The other way around is the exclusion condition, so five out of six don't like you, would not like to get again in touch with you or, or whatever. So that's the two tradition. Um, we did a lot of behavior tests after that. For example, we did the thin slices, we did the drug game and the emotion recognition. For the for time's sake, I don't want to go into all individual details here, just to give you a summary of what we found. Um, actually, what we expected was that the effects are stronger for the exclusion. Um, but to our surprise, the effects were stronger for the social inclusion. So the marked behavioral effects were found here. Um, in the inclusion condition, there was a reduced sensitivity for positive social cues. We found a reduced expectation of being socially accepted. So that was really unusual or unexpected for the subject. And they did not adapt to positive social feedback. Even if they were told that they are like this, they did not adapt, and uh, for example, in the social um, money exchange game, they could not adapt to positive social feedback. Um, so, a bit surprising, but we interpreted it in that way that we thought this is the inclusion condition, is actually the unusual condition. So, online patients are not used to being included and react. Uh, paradoxically to being included, uh, they, for them it's a new and unexpected situation and they have strong problems in adapting to positive feedback. And that's now coming back again um, for the last time to uh, therapy. How can that be used? So how can social information processes be improved? That's a, so a mechanism-based computer training uh, Martin Bowles and Stephanie List uh, have developed. It's called Social Zoo. So they learn a lot of social interaction, um, reacting and giving social feedback, uh, approaching instead of avoiding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's all done in a very playful way in an, in the, uh, uh, in an internet-based um, computer training. We are just um, evaluating now. All right, so I think uh, at the end of my time, 45 minutes, and want to summarize and conclude, uh, I wanted to talk, uh, tell you a little bit about recent findings uh, of core pathological mechanisms in DPD. I showed you how pain processing is disturbed, how this is related to non suicidal death injury. Uh, I found, showed you some recent findings on the impact of stress on impulsivity and aggression and how this is related to glutamate and GABA levels. And social interaction deficits, a relatively new story uh, where we have find marked differences uh, in borderline patients to control when we include them. So uh, the uh, problems with social inclusion. On the neural level, the best uh, evidence is here for emotion regulation and uh, how this is related to amygdala hyperactivity and prefrontal limbic interaction deficits and how this can be changed. It can be changed by regular psychotherapy. I showed you that 
amygdala activity can normalize uh, in both directions. Um, with three presence, it can be downregulated, with pain can be upregulated after DVT. And uh, more specifically, we have developed the neurofeedback training for the amygdala, where we downregulate the overactive amygdala and have some preliminary findings that, that also improve psychopathology um, also in everyday life. And overall, I wanted to show you that this approach, what we call mechanism-based therapy, opens the possibility to tailor more neurobiologically informed treatment in the future. So before I end, I want to thank a lot of people here. And you can see here this picture from our last uh, retreat of our clinical research unit that was funded by the German Research Foundation and which was responsible for most of the research uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, here, for example, you see Sabine Herbert. So, um, uh, we have a lot of projects together here at the Clinical Research Unit. And um, thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed that. Hello? <laughs> we can't. So unfortunately, we can't ask him any questions, uh, but we'll tell him thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I, oh, I you can? Know. He can hear. Oh, okay. Is there a question? Um, come up and sit and quickly. Ask him what he means when he says DBT. What's the extent of it? How much of it? How long? Okay. Um, so the question is, what is when you say DBT? Can you explain exactly what that is? How long it is? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, what we in, in, in these uh, studies I presented is the uh, twelve-week inpatient um, residential treatment DBT. A very intensive uh, treatment, about uh, all in all fifteen to twenty um, hours uh, psychotherapy per week. In a residential setting. Okay, great. Yeah. Any any other questions? Yes. Um, in one of the slides, you were focusing on pain regulation and the amygdala. You were showing the left amygdala in the slide. Do you find many hemispheric differences in terms of left right amygdala? The the question had to do with um, left versus right amygdala. Of divisions and is it hemispheric changes? Is, is, is that a hemispheric specificity? Is that the question? Is it left versus right or both? Yeah, most is, um, the more robust findings are for the right amygdala. Uh, we find the effect for both sides, but the effect sizes are bigger for the right amygdala. All right. Come up and say. <laughs> Hi, Kristen. Can you hear me? Sure, Can you hear yeah. me? Okay. So you find that bigger amygdala predicts better response to DBT. I'm curious in that sample if they had, if the borderlines had a bigger amygdala than the healthy controls, or is it just an individual difference? It's an individual difference. On average, they have, a, uh, they don't have a significant difference in the group. It's just an individual predictor. Okay. Okay. Well, Christian, thank you so much. We really appreciate your efforts okay. and um, thank, you. thank you again.